If you were alive during Jesus' day and during the crucifixion, and, and being a believer, would you have even attended the crucifixion? Would you have been there? As, as I was thinking about this and contemplating this over the last week and everything, I was, I was really wondering if I, if I would even go because the sight would be so horrendous. And then, and then you start to think, okay, so we decide okay, we're going to go to the crucifixion. We're going to go there because we're, we're followers of Jesus. So then the thought becomes, how close to the cross would you have gotten? Mm -hmm. Right? As I thought about that, I was thinking that I would probably be on the outskirts somewhere, maybe. Um, because I don't know that I would want to get close. The, the thought of being so close that we could see the agony on Jesus' face just really, just, it scares me. Um, being so close that you could actually hear his rasping breaths and hear his final words. Would you have gotten that close if you had been there? And as we think about that, as we, as we contemplate that thought about being there on that day, how close to the cross are you today? How close are you willing to get today? Think about it. Paul tells us in Corinthians, he says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. All right, then he goes on and he says, Jews demand a miraculous sign. The Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. It is the cross itself where the power of God manifests itself. So how close to the cross are you going to get today? This week. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the different people of the cross and, and who, those who were present during the crucifixion and what the cross did in their lives. And some of the things that we looked at over the week was the distance that these people were standing from the cross. So today, I want to talk about some people who were at the cross. We want to look at the women who were ministering to Jesus and who were at the cross, and how their distance to the cross affected their lives. And I want to point out that the distance you are to the cross today directly affects how you live your life. It is directly manifested in what you do in life. And I want to make it clear, I'm not talking about works righteousness here, I'm not talking about anything like that, I'm talking about we know that salvation comes from Jesus alone, and once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are saved, right? We talked about the fact in our, in our epistle lesson, when you accept Christ, it's done. It's a done deal. However, once you accept Christ, then your life changes, right? That cross makes an impression on your life. That impression changes your thoughts, your attitudes, and your actions, so as we look at these three women, I want to point out that this, the cross changed their lives. And first we're going to look at Mary Magdalene. And we're going to talk about how being near the cross changed her life, gave her a changed life overall. Luke chapter 8 tells us that Mary Magdalene had been possessed by seven demons and that she had been freed by Jesus, right? He cast out all seven demons. And have you ever thought about how terrible life would be in that condition? We looked at different scripture texts. We talked about the demon-possessed man who was in the Decapolis. If you remember, he was the guy living in the tombs, and he was naked, and nobody could restrain him, and he broke chains. And then the text tells us that he cut himself regularly with rocks. And then the text says that the demon tormented him day and night. Can you imagine how life would be? How terrible it would be on and on and on? Satan works against us, right? Satan was at work against Mary Magdalene. Satan was living in Mary Magdalene, we could even say, right? And we can think about how her life was, how much havoc was going on, how much damage was being done physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and how her life was just spiraling down. 
She was in probably a hopeless and helpless situation, at least according to what she was thinking. And then Jesus came along and he cast out the demons, delivered her from bondage. He literally set her free. Now let's apply that, just that little thought to our lives today, right? We live in a fallen world. Sin and bondage are around us constantly, dragging us down, causing all kinds of torment, wrecking havoc physically, emotionally, and spiritually in our lives today. And Jesus comes along and casts out that bondage, right? Think about it. Mary Magdalene's life was changed from that moment on. We ask, okay, so what does that have to do with the cross? That cost Jesus a tremendous amount. The fact that he cast out the bondage in our lives cost Jesus a tremendous amount. We see it at the cross, don't we? Acts chapter 26, Jesus tells Paul, I will deliver you from the Jewish people and the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to the power of God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Right? That call was given directly to Paul, but it is reflected to us, because as we accept Jesus in our lives as Lord and Savior, we are called to go out to the Gentiles around us and spread the gospel, to share, to share with them so they can go from darkness to light. When we accept Jesus, we are removed from our bondage of sin. We, re we move from darkness to light. And that cost God a tremendous amount, didn't it? God sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, right? So as we go from the power of Satan to the power of God, as we see that in Mary Magdalene, we see a changed life. As Mary Magdalene stood at the cross that day, you can imagine that she realized the cost that it took for God to redeem her. The question I have for you today is, do you realize the cost that God paid to redeem you today? Scripture is very clear. Without a shadow of a doubt, it's very clear. It says someone has to pay the penalty of sin, right? Paul tells us the wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die for your sins. That somebody was Jesus, God's son. Jesus died to redeem us from the bondage of sin. For us to move out of the darkness into light, do you realize that Jesus had to move from the light of heaven into the darkened world that's around us today? Have you ever thought about that? Jesus did that for you so that you could be delivered from the power of Satan. Plain and simple. Somebody had to die. Mary stood at the cross and realized that that's what the, penalty, that's what the cost was. And it changed her life completely. So again, how close to the cross are you standing today? Do you understand that the cross is the symbol of redemption? That is the power of God. Do your lives reflect the light that God has given you? Or are you more content letting your life reflect the darkness of the world around you? That brings us to the next woman at the cross and talk about Salome. Salome was the wife of Zebedee, who was the mother of James and John. And in Salome, we see that being near the cross corrected her life. She thought her life was just fine. She was a believer. She followed the law of God. She was walking the path she thought she should be walking. And yet the cross corrected her life, showed her the error of her ways, if you will. If you remember, Salome was the one that asked Jesus earlier on that if her sons... James and John, could have places of honor in heaven, right? She went up to Jesus and said, Jesus, you know, if you love me, give my sons places of honor. Let one sit on your right hand and one sit on your left hand. Now, she was only asking and looking out for the best for her sons, right? Which one of you, any of you, would, would not desire the absolute best for your children, right? Or your family members. And she didn't think anything wrong. She just wanted the absolute best for her kids, 
But Jesus pointed out that the request that she was asking was extremely selfish. Extremely self-centered, even though she didn't see it that way. Jesus said, you just don't know what it is you are asking. And he says, can they drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Right? In, in reference to his death. And think about this. If James and John had drank the cup that Jesus drank, right, the wrath of God, what would happen to them? They would be in eternal torment today. Period. Because you cannot pay the penalty of your sin. Right? You do not measure up. Jesus is the only one that did. So he says, if we grant that request, if we allow that to happen, they do not measure up. And as we think about this, we think about her standing at the cross that day. We think about her standing there looking at what's going on with Jesus. And you wonder if she thought of the request that she had made for her, for her kids, for her boys. But before that, Jesus had corrected her thinking. Jesus had corrected the way she was thinking and correcting the way she was living. And she realized that she was not doing what she needed to do. She was not following all the rules of the law. She needed to turn to Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And also to that fact, Jesus also taught her the secret to success living a Christian life. You guys know what that secret is? Simple. Serving. And we're all called to be ministers. The word minister is servant. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 20, whoever desires to become great among you, let him serve. That is the secret to success in the Christian life. Serving. It's near the cross that we see that our selfishness is corrected. Because you cannot serve with a selfish attitude, right? If we have a selfish attitude, who are we looking out for? Self. You can't serve looking out that way. You have to serve looking out for others. It's at the cross we see the selflessness of Jesus himself. It's at the cross that we put things into perspective, begin to see life in a different way. We begin to see the power of being a servant. The foolishness of the cross, right, is wisdom or power to us who are being saved, right? It is in the cross or at the cross where we gain understanding of honoring God and serving Him. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And finally, we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. Right? We all know the story there, right? Mary was standing at the cross looking at her, her son who's being crucified. And Jesus looks down from the cross and sees Mary and John standing there. And he turns to his mom and he says, Behold your son. And he turns to John and says, Hey, that's your mom now. Take care of her. As, as Don read in the, in the text today, the idea is Jesus was looking out for others. Jesus was committed to doing things for others, to serving. And in being near the cross, Mary gave, became or had a committed life. The cross showed her true commitment, didn't it? Because isn't that what Jesus showed? Commitment clear to the end, even unto death. Are you that committed to God, to Christ? It's easy to say yes right now. In our cozy sanctuary and as things are going on. But, but when you're pressed, that's when the commitment really shows. Mm -hmm. Right? Now we know that, she, that Mary was committed to Jesus as she raised him and you know, she bore him. Um, all of the things that we know that Mary did prior to. But, but at the very end, watching his commitment to God come to fruition. Can you imagine that feeling? I was thinking that Mary had to have been thinking of the words that were spoken to her 30 some years before by Simon or uh, by Simeon um, on the temple steps when she took her baby in to be circumcised at eight days old. She was stopped by Simeon, this old man sitting on the temple steps, 
And Simeon said, This child is destined to cause the, fa cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword shall pierce your so own soul also. So this is the sword that he prophesied about, right? Can you imagine her, her grief at watching her son go through this? 30-some, 36 years before, she's wondering, what is Simeon talking about? And now she realizes it, right? But even at that moment, Jesus looked on her and had compassion on her, right? We talked about that, and Jesus said, look, I will take care of you, even to the end. So for Mary to stand at the cross was to stand with real commitment. Are you committed to the cross of Christ today? If you are not living a committed, consistent life, I'm going to ask you to look at where you are standing at the cross. How distant is the cross in your life today? Because the closer to the cross you stand, the more committed you tend to be. The more changed you tend to be. So look at your lives. That's my encouragement for you today. Look at your life and see where you are standing, especially as we, as we come to the end of the Lenten season. Um, next Sunday is uh, Palm Sunday, so we begin the, with the start of Passion Week. I encourage you that as we look at the cross and what the, all of it stands for and what it really means, I encourage you to look at your placement around it. How close to it are you? How committed are you? How changed has it caused you in your life? Because it's at the cross, like we sang in that song, it is at the cross that we receive the strength and the power to live our lives for Christ. So the closer we get, the stronger we become. Let's pray.